Let us worship this morning. We gather to seek God, to praise the Creator, to adore the Son, to abide in the Spirit, to give thanks to the Lord for He is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. And so we gather on this last Sunday of Lent to share in the praise of Pan Sunday, to anticipate the events of Holy Week, to journey towards the cross and the tomb, to give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We gather together bringing all the worries and the wonders of the world, bringing all that is heavy in our hearts, or light in our souls, bringing all the joys and challenges of life, whatever our circumstances, to give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let's have the intro. <laughs> so much thank you for not letting me forget that lady. that was absolutely wonderful now we commence our praise of one of the traditional and much loved Pam Sunday hymns <laughs> Thank you. 
Now let us pray. Gracious God, as we remember this day how Jesus entered Jerusalem to cries of celebration, help us to welcome him afresh into our own hearts and our lives. Accept the praise and worship we bring you and give us a real sense of expectation as we look towards his coming kingdom. Hosanna to the Son of David, glory in the highest heaven. Yet we know in our hearts, even as we greet you, sincere though we may be, that our worship and our commitment is sometimes as weak and shallow as that which greeted you as you entered Jerusalem long ago. Then the shouts of Hosanna turned to the cries of crucify, the hands outstretched in friendship became fists curled up in hate. The declarations of loyalty became voices raised in mockery and rejection. We too, even while professing faith and going through the motions of commitment, can push you aside, preferring our own way to yours. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, on this day we are reminded of how easy it is to welcome you as King of Kings, but how hard to follow the way of the cross. Lord Jesus, have mercy. For in your name we ask it, remembering these words you taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, we weren't terribly sure whether we were going to have children in church today because the holidays have begun, but I'm really pleased to see that we've got quite a few people. So I've got a very important question to ask you all. How many of you have seen the movie Shrek? Oh yes, hands going up. I'd better put my hand down. I haven't seen it. But I know it's a very, very popular movie. And the question I wanted to ask you is, who is your favorite character from that movie, Shrek? Now, I haven't seen the film, but I've read up about it, so I know which the four main characters are, and I've got pictures along with me today. So here are some of the choices. Here's the first one. That Shrek himself, right, okay. Everyone seen that? I don't know how well the choir of Shrek, but there's, there's Shrek himself. That's the first choice. The next choice. Donkey. Donkey, yes. We all know about Donkey. I've got another two choices. I'm told was the other main character. Puss in Boots. Okay, there are your four choices. 
Which is the favourite? How many people would vote for Shrek? There's one sort of hesitant adult hand going up. How many would vote for Donkey? Oh, there's lots of adults going up as well as children's hands. How many people would vote for Princess Fiona? One, yes. One keeping up the side there. And how many would vote for Puss in Boots? Oh, no one would vote for Puss in Boots. Well, one or two would say yes. But there's a very dominant answer there, isn't there? The donkey. And I'm told that that generally is true. If you ask people their favourite character out of that movie, Shrek, most people will say donkey. Donkeys are nice animals. They're, they're sort of harmless animals. They're friendly animals to some extent. And I want to tell you a story this morning. But it's not a story about Shrek. It's a story that has a donkey in it. Or to be strictly accurate, two donkeys. But the story's not about the donkeys either. It's a story about Jesus. So here we go. We were just a few short miles from Jerusalem. We'd stayed in a wee village not far from the city. We'd been welcomed by a family that were friendly with Jesus. Lazarus was the man of the house. It's not surprising that family were devoted to Jesus. Lazarus was the guy who had died and his body had even been put in a tomb. But Jesus had astonished everyone by saying, no, Lazarus wasn't dead. And he'd gone to the tomb and called out to Lazarus and help my Bob. Lazarus slowly walked out of the tomb into his family's arms. That had all happened some time before our latest visit. But no wonder that family were always delighted to meet with Jesus and to put us up for a night or two. And no wonder that Mary had used the costliest of oils to anoint Jesus that other night. Although what a weird and strange sight that she poured the oil on his feet, of all things, and let her hair down and wiped his feet with her hair. We weren't all that happy about that. It seemed a bit unseemly. And Judas moaned. But Jesus quietened everyone by saying it was a wonderful thing that Mary had done for her. Truly, that family loved the master well, and we were all glad of that. Of course, we'd been warning Jesus for days on end that he shouldn't go near Jerusalem. There were people out to get him, and it would be dangerous to go there particularly at Passover time, that great Jewish festival when the town would be swarming with crowds of excitable people. But it was strange. He was determined to go to Jerusalem. That's where he had to go and he wouldn't change his mind, no matter what we told him. Except that when we reached, after a short while, the village of Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives, where we could actually see Jerusalem on its hilly location in the distance, Jesus sent two of our group ahead of us, and he gave them the strangest of tasks. They were to go on to the next village and find not just one, but two donkeys waiting there, tied up and ready to go. He must have messaged ahead to arrange this because he instructed our two men to untie both animals and bring them to Jesus. And if anyone was to challenge them as to why they were taking these donkeys, they were simply to say, the Lord has needed them and everything would be okay. 
I suppose it must have been some kind of password that Jesus had arranged with the owners. And so we met up with the two donkeys, which was useful because in the warmth of the day we were all able to put our outer cloaks on their backs, something we couldn't usually do when travelling. And Jesus too mounted on one of the donkeys. But here's another strange thing. He chose to ride on the younger donkey. Isn't that an odd thing to do? We all thought he would ride on the big donkey, the strong and confident adult donkey used to carry burdens. Surely Jesus must have intended to do that all along. That would be why he arranged for two donkeys, a young one and its parent, because everyone knows that donkeys can be stubborn. Just as well. Because as we started to get near to the gates of the big city, there were already crowds of folk all around us. Lining the roadway, some were shouting, and a young donkey on its own, without that reassuring presence of its parent, would have been frightened and unpredictable. Jesus is so practical and clever. Everything was taken care of. Clearly, some of these crowds had known to expect Jesus coming. They seemed eager to welcome him. Some of them must have already known how special Jesus was. Some even threw down their cloaks on the dusty roadway for Jesus and ourselves in procession behind him to walk over. Some others actually hacked down branches from the roadside trees, spread the leaves over the roadway to form a comfortable pathway for us to walk over. And some of the eager crowd started to walk in front of us to lead us in procession into the city. Others tagged on behind. It was wonderful. None of us had ever seen the light. And they were all shouting out in praise of Jesus. They called out, Hosanna, which in our language means save us. It's a word of praise because they knew that Jesus is special. He is the one who saves people. And they shouted out Bible verses from our Jewish book of Psalms. Oh, what a day it was when Jesus went into Jerusalem. It was splendid from start to finish. But the city was absolutely crammed full of people. Not all of them had been expecting to see Jesus. As these other people heard the shouts and the commotion and saw Jesus on this donkey, they were asking, who on earth is this? These other folk weren't there to see Jesus. They were there for the week of the Passover and were expecting a different kind of procession of soldiers and important religious folks. Not a poor wandering teacher called Jesus from a backwater village with his wee band of followers like myself. And so we were able to tell them, helped by the folk in the crowd who also knew the answer, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth from Nazareth in Galilee. What a wonderful day it was. A day to be remembered forever. It was to be the start of an amazing and a topsy-turvy week. A week of the most amazing events that showed how right we had been to warn Jesus that going to Jerusalem would be the most dangerous thing he could do but strangely enough, he knew that all along. He was determined to go there, and Jerusalem was where he must go. And so started a week that would send us to the depths of absolute fearfulness and misery, and then raise our spirits to joy like we'd never experienced before. But that's another story. It's the story that the church would remember every year 
in its own festival that Christians call Holy Week. Yet every year on Palm Sunday, people forevermore will remember Jesus riding in procession on that young donkey into Jerusalem. And they too will join together in songs and hymns, praising Jesus with that word, Hosanna, Saviour. Is that not a wonderful story? And it's a true story. And it's a story that we're going to continue now as we sing our next hymn. Our next hymn, I don't know if it's new to the choir, but it's new to me. Yes, it is new to everyone. It's a wonderful hymn that talks about these events that we've just been hearing about in the story. Jesus goes where things are rough. Jesus knows when life is tough. Always comes to us, his friends. So his story never ends. Let us sing this wonderful hymn, Come Into the Streets with me, number 366.
Open to me the gates of the temple. I will go in and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. Only the righteous can come in. I praise you, Lord, because you heard me, because you have given me victory. The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. This is the day of the Lord's victory. Let us be happy. Let us celebrate. Save us, Lord. Save us. Give us success, O Lord. May God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. With the temple of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. He has been good to us. With branches in your hands, start the festival and march round the altar. You are my God, and I give you thanks. I will proclaim your greatness. Give thanks to the Lord, because he is good, and his love is eternal. Amen. And I think we now have the anthem, is that right? I remembered. <laughs> Walking behind him, 
to shepherd. He prays to David's son. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Who is he? He asked. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Here for these readings, and thanks again to the choir for that uh, well rehearsed anthem. Thank you. We sing again Make way, make way, for Christ the King in splendour arrives. Fling wide the gates and welcome him into your lives. It's number 279. Make way, make way. <laughs> so well known, yet I think commonly somewhat misunderstood. That's why I gave that strange title to this reflection, Lordly Entry, Donkey, Okay. Perhaps that's a silly title. I was trying to make a play in the words Don Quixote. I don't know if anyone caught that allusion. But the point is, to Jesus, that donkey was an essentially important symbol for his entry as Lord and long-promised Messiah into that capital city. You see, we have been conditioned, have we not, from earliest Sunday school days into imagining that the entire population of Jerusalem was ready and waiting to greet Jesus as Messiah when he reached Jerusalem. Yet in the fickleness of crowds, and sure enough we know how fickle crowd populism can be, all those same people later in the week were shouting, 
for Jesus to be put to death. But I find increasingly that Bible commentators and preachers who understand the historical context are pointing out that the reality of what was going on that Passover week in Jerusalem was just a bit different. The first thing we need to understand is that this triumphal entry into Jerusalem was deliberately staged by Jesus. The instruction to go to the village and collect the two donkeys indicates what Jesus was about to do was all stage managed by him. It was all in deliberate fulfilment of that prophecy in the book of Zechariah chapter 9. And it was important to Jesus not only that he fulfilled that prophecy, but that he was also seen to be fulfilling it. Let me read the two verses from the New International Version, which tries to catch accurately the Hebrew translation. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem. No, Jerusalem was the scene. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation. Hence the shouts, Hosanna, save. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots of Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. Did you hear that contrast between war horses and peace? His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And by the river we understand the river Euphrates. Thus, Jesus gave deep evidence of his own deep consciousness of who he was. He was again giving a deliberate claim to the King of Jerusalem, the King of the Jews according to the Scriptures, and he was publicly affirming what kind of a king he had come to be. Notice the emphasis in that prophecy of the gentleness of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not some kind of a political firebrand. One writer suggests that Jesus' little ragtag procession would have been a blip in the screen compared to what was going on at the other side of town. At that other side of Jerusalem, Pontius Pilate was entering the city, coming in from the coast with 600 foot soldiers, horses, armour, banners and flags and standards bearing great carved golden eagles, the symbol of Roman authority and beating drums. Pilate didn't live in Jerusalem normally. He moved up there from the coast where he had his comfortable villa by the sea. And the cadence of heavy footfall in Jerusalem during Passover would have been teeming with Jewish pilgrims from all around and a hotbed of political tension. I've read that at that point in the year there might have been a million people in Jerusalem. Rome wanted Israel to be in no doubt about who was in charge. Can you imagine it? The cheers would have been eerily similar to the ones we think of when we remember Palm Sunday. After all, Caesar was Rome's Prince of Peace and many of the people in Jerusalem would have been there to see the spectacle of that Roman procession. 
It would be like a sort of military procession we see from time to time on TV news reports. This sort, for instance, we may see glimpses of in Korea or other authoritarian states, North Korea, I mean. The sort of a procession that will feature in Moscow in early May. Some knowledgeable observers are saying that President Putin will be determined to have some kind of victory over Ukraine to celebrate at that May parade. That is the kind of parade I think most of the crowd in Jerusalem expected to see that day. Caesar, you see, was considered to be Rome's son of God, and Pontius Pilate was his representative. And then came Jesus, down from the Mount of Olives on a donkey, on an agricultural tool, not a war machine. The imagery couldn't have been clearer. I am for peace. We could even consider the triumphal entry as a send-off, a parody of Pilate's grand procession, a mockery of it. And it was a staged demonstration by Jesus. So today we follow in a long line of holy protests. Jesus' disciples today still claim that real power and authority sit with peace. The donkey was a symbol of the peace of Jesus' glorious kingdom. Jesus was not like Pilate. Jesus had no intention of forcing people into submission to him. Sometimes I think the donkey is wrongly thought of as a symbol of the humility of Jesus. Some of our hymns refer to Jesus coming to Jerusalem in humility. And many Bible translations, as we heard already this morning, also use that word humble in their translation of the Zechariah passage. That's why I'm glad that the New International Version uses the word gentle, not humble. You see, Jesus comes in meekness, not weakness. There is a difference. A warlike king in Old Testament times would lead his men into a sea city on a large and a mighty war horse. But in peaceful procession, a peaceful mount, possibly a white foal or even an ass, would be used. Yet he was still king, a ruler, and not to be trifled with or despised. We pervert the real Jesus when we picture him on a war charger instead of meekly seated on a donkey. Why don't you open the gates of the city of your life and let him enter, meek, and gentle. Some people are hesitant to believe in Jesus until they feel that they receive some kind of revelatory assurance. If Jesus crashes in on their lives in dramatic fashion, then they would believe. Don't wait for him to break down the doors. He's not that kind of Jesus. So what? Some might say. So what if there were two parades? What does that matter? Well, I think perhaps it matters because there are always two parades, aren't there? And we have to decide which one we will join. When we choose to forgive or not, we choose a certain path. When we choose what we will do with our money, our energy, 
our love, yes, even perhaps our church and man's buildings. We walk a certain way. Let's open our doors to the Master. Not in weakness, but in meekness. Join that Jesus parade of meek righteousness and join those shouts of Hosanna, Saviour. Amen. And may God bless to us this reflection, this Palm Sunday reflection on his word. And now as we look towards the remembrances of Holy Week, we sing our next hymn, it's number 365. O Saviour meek, pursue thy road with palms and scattered garments strode. Ride on, ride on in majesty. as a poor man, not in style, but simply. Yet still you caused uproar and questions everywhere. You drew the expectations of a hungry crowd and brought buried conflicts to the light. May we, who are sometimes swayed by the crowd's approval, and who often avoid conflict for fear of its cost to us, hold fast to the gospel of peace and justice, and follow faithfully in your way of compassion and solidarity with those who are poor and excluded, wherever it may lead us. 
Come again now, Lord Jesus Christ, and establish your kingdom. Come afresh to our troubled world with all of its needs, its tensions, its problems, and its evil. Bring healing where there is division, love where there is hatred, hope where there is despair, joy where there is sorrow, confidence where there is fear, strength where there is weakness, healing where there is sickness, life where there is death. Lord Jesus Christ, reach out to your church and world despite the weakness of our faith and the rejection of so many. And Lord, hear us as we pray for a moment in silence with the particular petitions that we have on our personal hearts. And so, Lord Jesus Christ, may your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Come again now, and establish your kingdom, for in your name we pray. Amen. And our last hymn this morning is number 364. All glory, God, and honour. To you, before your passion, they sang their hymns of praise. To you, now high exalted, our melody we raise. Let us sing.
with now our dismissal blessing. Christ, crucified, draw you to himself, to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Thank you.